All righty, so I'm going to be covering cardiology, so pediatric cardiology. I'm David, by the way. And so um, for your, in terms of your exams and OSCEs, cardiology tends not to be a very big topic. Um, the big thing you guys need to learn a lot about is congenital heart diseases. So that's the thing I'm going to spend most of this presentation talking about. Um, generally, there's always, you can more or less guarantee there's always going to be three or four questions on these congenital heart diseases. But um, as you all know, PEDS is very buzzwordy. So um, I'm probably going to give a lot more information than you probably need for the exams. Um, I'm also going to quickly cover two other topics, which is kind of cardiovascular related, so rheumatic fever and uh, Kawasaki's disease. Um, uh, there hasn't really been a cardiology OSCEs in the past few years, but um, maybe one of these congenital heart diseases could pop up, so it might be worthwhile learning. So probably had too much content, but you know. We'll start with congenital heart diseases. So. Um, I tried to summarize embryology down to two slides because I know it's really boring, but um, just on the, uh, just uh, hopefully everyone can see that, but at a very basic level, you should know that the heart forms a heart tube, which is just one long tube, with the venous and the atrium down the bottom and what's called the truncus arteriosus at the top. This is what's eventually gonna become the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Um, and then it kind of twists on itself and then you get your classic heart shape afterwards. Uh, whilst it's doing this twisting motion, the two sides need to separate. So there's two septums that form. So the atrial and the ventricle septums. So the atrial septum is formed by two septums. So there's the septum primum, which forms first. So the septum primum comes and as it's closing down, this little hole that while it's fusing, it's called the osteum primum, if you remember from second year or first year. Um, and then as this is closing, a second hole forms, which is the osteosecundum, which is in, so the osteosecundum is actually in the septum primum, just to make it confusing. Um, whilst this is closing, the septum secundum, so the second layer forms over top. It itself also has a hole called the foramen ovale, and this creates a one-way shunt. Um, the, vent the ventricles is a lot more simple, so the apex forms a muscular proportion that goes towards the endocardial cushions in the middle. And the endocardial cushions has a membranous portion that kind of links together. Um, that's basically all you need to know to understand congenital heart diseases, which, um, and when something goes wrong in one of these steps, you get all the congenital heart diseases. A uh, little bit about fetal circulation as well. So as we know, the fetus doesn't supply its own oxygen for its lung because it can't breathe. So, um, and yes, it doesn't use its liver because the mom is doing all the work. So it has a different circulation compared to what we normally have. So again, running through what, um, you know, what you guys learned in first year is that the um, oxygenated blood comes from the umbilical vein some of it bypasses the liver through the uh, venous ductus venosum. They all go to the inferior vena cava. And then all of this goes through the hole we mentioned before, so the, um, uh, the uh, foramen ovale, into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, out into the aorta. Some of it, a little bit of it does go into the right ventricle and that goes into the pulmonary system, but that gets shunted through what's known as the ductus arteriosus. And that becomes very important later on when we talk about cyanotic uh, heart diseases. Um, after birth, um, this system flips because now the lungs have um, inflates. So now the, um, the vessel pressures here is way less. So this, uh, the left heart becomes, uh, the left heart has higher pressures than the right heart, closing the foramen ovale. This ductus um, arteriosus also begins to close as there's less and less prostaglandin and it's mediated by bradykinin and that causes, creates the ligamentum arteriosum. And then the other shunts also close. So that's basically all you need to know to understand what we're gonna talk about. So congenital heart diseases. So the best way to split these up is to split these into two categories. So acyanotic and cyanotic. So whether or not the baby turns blue. And with the acyanotic, it's also helpful to distinguish them between the ones that have a left to right shunt and the ones that are obstructive and thus causing the congenital heart disease. So I'll first talk about acyanotic heart diseases. So the reason why they're still acyanotic is even though there's some sort of defect, the blood still is able to pass through the pulmonary circulation and thus there's enough oxygenation that occurs. Um, so there's two main categories, as I said, the left to right shunts. So this is what happens when there's for some reason a pathway between the left and right heart. 
and as such, oxygenated blood is getting mixed with unoxygenated. Um, uh, it's going back to the right heart, um, reox, going back to the um, pulmonary circulation. Um, so um, as you can see, this will obviously cause an issue because now there's all this pressure that's going to the pulmonary system that shouldn't be there. So this tends to cause increased pulmonary blood flow. This leads to pulmonary hypertension, leads to pulmonary vascular disease, and eventually can lead to heart failure. Um, and as well as something called Eisenmenger syndrome, which is basically when the left to right shunt flips to a right to left shunt. Um, that's more for fun fact, and I don't think it's ever gonna pop up in an MCQ. But the other type is the obstructive. So the obstructive type has to be a lesion somewhere that's obstructing the blood flow, but as it's still being oxygenated, it has to be somewhere beyond the lungs. And then these patients will present with poor perfusion. So things like pallor, cold extremities, decreased urine output, pulses, and can go into shock if it's very severe. So we'll talk about the left to right stunts first. So we're gonna talk about the most common one. So the ventricular septal defect. Um, this is due to the septums. As we talked about, the ventricular septum closes from two ends. It's generally the membranous part that doesn't close properly. And this leads to this defect. Uh, we separate uh, VSDs into two categories. So we separate it into mild or uh, moderate to severe. So majority of the cases will be very mild. There'll be a little hole like this that um, forms. And these patients are generally asymptomatic and they generally don't even show up with any developmental issues. The only reason that we know about these is because um, pediatricians really like listening to the heart and then they find a murmur. So the murmur that you need to remember is a pan-systolic murmur that's loudest in the left lower sternal border. Um, um, and the reason why it's really loud is you think of um, a flow going through a small area creates a lot more noise than flow going through a large area. So you can kind of imagine it like blowing through a very small hole versus like blowing through a very big hole. Um, I kind of like to remember, I've got stupid mnemonics for all of these things. So um, how I remember is like VSDs looks like first, so it looks like a competition. So I think MasterChef was its pan, so pan systolic memo. Um, might be a bit of a stretch, but we're gonna go with it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think master should have when I pick BSD, but that's probably just me. With your investigations, um, most of these investigations are going to be normal because these patients are asymptomatic. Um, but you will, you should, as with most of these congenital heart diseases, you should do an echo because that will diagnose the condition for you. So, and then with these, most of them close spontaneously. You don't need to do anything for these mild cases. So moderate to large, and how we define it to be moderate large is if the size of the defect is larger than the size of the aortic valve, in which case it creates an issue because now the blood prefers going through the septum, uh, through the small hole, rather than going through the, um, the aortic valve. And this generally presents a few weeks or months after birth, and they tend to be the patients that are failing to thrive. Uh, they can present with signs of um, heart failure, so they can be tachypneic, increased work of breathing. They can get frequent chest infections because there's all this uh, pulmonary pressure. And this tends to be exacerbated when they're eating. So they tend to have really poor feeding because eating takes a lot of effort. Um, and so um, they get really short of breath while they're eating. So in this case, it's actually a soft or even an absent pansystolic murmur because of how big the hole is. And then you can also get signs of pulmonary hypertension. So allow P2, parasternal heat, and for your heart failure signs. Um, for your chest x-ray, you get a heart failure kind of picture. So you get increased pulmonary vasculature and you get cardiomegaly. And again, the echo is the diagnostic test. Um, with these patients, it's really important to treat the symptoms. So especially if they're failing to thrive, you need to make sure that you support their feeding to give them a high calorie diet. And if it's heart failure, you treat it like anyone else with heart failure. So you give them ACE inhibitors and diuretics. And um, Given that they're symptomatic, you need to fix these. They're generally not gonna close by themselves. Next is atrial septal defect. So atrial septal defect is kind of less common, of only about 8%. There's three main types, but the one type that you, have, you should know about is the ostium secundum. So as I said before, the two layers kind of creates this one-way shunt. But if for some reason, one of the holes is too big, then you kind of get this empty hole where the septal, uh, where blood can flow through. So either this um, forearm ovale is too big or the septum primum creates the osteo secundum too big. So for one way or another, there's a 
oh, that's too big. This has uh, the two other types. Um, I guess osteum primum is also some people consider it as a partial ABSD, and that's because it's formed from the um, osteum primum um, as the septum primum is closing. And so it kind of looks a bit like an AVSD, and thus um, it's associated with things such as Down syndrome and fetal alcohol syndrome. And because it's so close to the valves, generally there's also valve involvement. Last type, just for your information, is sinus venosum, which is near the SVC, but generally don't need to know. Just know that osteosecundum is the most common type. So clinical features, so ASCs tend to be very asymptomatic. They tend to be found incidentally, like those small VSDs. Most of them will close, especially if they're small. But then in severe cases, as with all the right to left shunts, um, you can get signs of heart failure, uh, left to right shunt, sorry. Um, with this one, you get a soft ejection systolic murmur and a fixed, wide, uh, fixed and split wide S2. Uh, this one's a bit, my monomics a bit not safe for work, but ass kind of looks like the bottom. So it's fixed and split, and it has, a, and you can use your creativity for your ejection systolic murmur. <laughs> so um, with your investigation, you're going to find that because there's this left to right shunt, the right heart's working harder than it should be, so you can get some right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy, and right bundle branch block. Again, you can get signs of heart failure on chest X-ray. But again, echo is the gold standard. And um, with these ones, they tend to close. But if they don't, you um, you know do a surgical catheter method to close them up. Alrighty. Um, and just a very quick on AVSDs. You don't really need to know much about these. Just know that it's common with Down syndrome. So if you see a MCR question that looks like VSD slash ASD, and you're like, I don't know which it is, but it's got Down syndrome, it's AVSD. Cool. Patent ductus arteriosum. So this is the second most type of birth defect. And uh, um, one you need to remember is that, I uh, said so the ductus arteriosum, as we said, is a shunt from the pulmonary artery to the aorta. However, once the, once, uh, the baby comes out, um, the left heart suddenly has more pressure than the right heart. So now it's creating this backflow if this doesn't close properly. Um, normally it closes within a day, so within 15 hours, and then it becomes the ligamentum over the next few days. Um, however, um, in, especially premature infants, it doesn't close properly. So if the MCQ question says premature infant, you have to think at PDA. Um, they can be asymptomatic if they're small, but they can get um, apneic spells, poor feeding, heart failure signs um, if they're untreated. Uh, the buzzword you need to remember is continuous machine-like murmur. Uh, and that's at the left infraclavicular area. And then there's also a bounding pulse. And the way to think about this is um, similar to aortic regurg, you've got this aorta which has this backflow to it. So the pulse is going to be, the pulse pressure is going to be very, um, very because this blood is now shunting back into the right heart. Uh, you can also get displaced apex beat from having a big heart and tachycardia to try to compensate for this backflow. Um, so uh, again, echo is a um, diagnostic test. And um, with the management, um, so there's managed differently from the preterms and the term babies. With the preterm babies, it's generally because, as I said before, um, uh, the prostaglandins are keeping the um, uh, ductus arteriosum open, um, but we can kind of interfere with that process by giving them some NSAIDs. So in the methicin, we inhibit that and close the PDA. In term babies, however, um, the issue generally isn't because there's um, still uh, prostaglandins in the area that's stopping it from closing. So these patients tend to need a catheter closure, so it needs to have surgical methods to close it. Um, even if they're, so they do it immediately if they're symptomatic, even if they're not symptomatic, you need to close them because there's a risk of infective endocarditis. So they generally get it done in the infant years, if, then, if not done immediately. So coarctation of the aorta. So this one, coarctation is very similar to the ones in adults, but um, for so there's a narrowing of the aorta. In congenital cases, it's generally just proximal to the doxus arteriosus. Uh, it's very heavily associated with Turner syndrome. Uh, these are tend to be asymptomatic, but if they are symptomatic, you get uh, you, all the blood is staying in the upper half of the body and not going down to the lower body. So you get lower limb cyanosis, you can get shock, and um, so on examination, the big 
clear out your like radio femoral delay as in adults, as well as a blood pressure difference between your upper and lower limbs. Uh, you can get diminished femoral pulse for obvious reasons, not enough blood is going down. And then you can also get an ejection systolic murmur as it's, it's kind of like an aortic stenosis in the sense that there's a little narrowing in the aorta that's preventing flow from going through. Uh, it's important to note that um, because it's proximal to the ductus arteriosus, uh, blood flow can still go through the ductus arteriosus to the lower limbs. So these signs may not present until later on. So once the ductus close, and then the lower limbs suddenly don't get any uh, perfusion. So investigations, so again, echo, but in this case, you can do an MRI in case it's not near the heart, uh, and that's diagnostic. And then it's kind of the opposite of the PDA in this case that we actually want to keep the ductus arteriosus open in this case to maintain flow to the bottom, uh, to the lower limbs. So we give them prostaglandin infusion. So that keeps them open. And then at some point they need to get this repaired. So a coarctation repair. Uh, the next two, uh, you don't need to know in a lot of detail, but um, they do show up in MCQ. So that's the only reason I put them here. So um, pulmonary stenosis, it's very common, but um, it's very associated with all your syndromes, so Noonan syndrome, Allergill syndrome, as well as um, congenital rubella. Um, it is also part of the Tetralogy of Fellow. Um, and it's very similar to what you see in adults. So you get an ejection systolic murmur in your left upper sternal border, so your pulmonary area. And these tend to be asymptomatic, but as with any valvular disease, can, uh, can progress to heart failure. Again, echo is diagnostic, and you can open the valve up with balloon valvoplasty if needed. Similarly, aortic stenosis, very similar to adults. Well, adults is due to age-related degeneration of the valve. Um, in kids, it tends to be more um, if they're like univalvular or bivalvular. Um, and these are often asymptomatic, um, but can present with your signs of aortic stenosis, which is your typical SAD, so syncope, angina, dyspnea. Um, again, you get the ejection systolic perma, um, this time in the aorta region. Um, it's important to note that oh, with both of these stenosis, you can get what's called an ejection click. So because this valve is so stiff, um, it kind of clicks open when the uh, blood flow is actually able to get through. So you can get an aortic ejection click with aortic stenosis and a pulmonary ejection click with a pulmonary stenosis. And similar to the, um, uh, similar to the um, coarctation, you can also get a slow rising from the pulse. Again, echo and balloon valvoplasty if needed. That's basically all you need to know for those. All right, cyanotic heart disease. So the issue with cyanotic heart disease is that the venous returns go straight back into um, the systemic circulation. And so you get cyanosis because the blood just bypasses the lungs and aren't getting the oxygenated they require. Um, the way to test for cyanotic heart disease if a baby comes out blue is just to give a lot of oxygen to the baby. If it corrects or slight partially corrects, then you can be pretty sure that some blood is, some oxygen is given to the blood. And so this is likely more to do a lung disease. Whereas if they don't respond at all, then it's likely to be cyanotic heart disease because no, uh, there's, uh, even if you give them a lot of oxygen, it's not an oxygen issue. You remember by five teeth? So truncus arteriosum, there's one trunk. Transportation of the great vessels is the two arteries. So the aorta and the pulmonary arteries are swapped. Tricuspid atresia, so tri, Right. And tetralogy of fallow is there's four divomities. And then the one that's kind of BS is total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, which is five words that we make do. Um, so the ones you really need to know are tetralogy of fallow and the transposition. So I'm going to talk a bit of detail about those ones. So tetralogy of fallow, um, one of the most common cyanide heart diseases, and it's associated with some congenital disease disorders, specifically the George and Downs. And the tetralogy refers to these for pathology. However, it's really easy. It's, I find it much easier to think of them in pairs. It's really only two pathology and two sequelae from the pathology. So if you start with pulmonary stenosis, so you're going to narrow up the pulmonary valve. And that causes right ventricular hypertrophy because now your right ventricle has to work a lot harder to pump all the blood through the, um, the pulmonary valve. You also have a VSD. And because of the VSD and the pulmonary stenosis, so the pulmonary stenosis is, a uh, pulmonary valve is small, you've got this big hole, this aorta is now covering a larger area than it should, so it kind of uh, takes in all the blood from both the ventricles instead of just one. So just think, just remember them in pairs and one 
the two of them are more um, the consequences of the other two than actually for pathologies. Um, most of these are picked up antenatally, so when they're in the womb. Um, the thing you need to know about tetralogy are things called TET spells. So TET spells are episodic cyanosis that occurs generally when the um, baby or the infant is exerting itself, so either crying or exercising. Um, when that happens, they become very cyanos, they can get um, rapid um, paroxysms of rapid breathing, they can be very irritable, um, they can be, or they can even go very floppy and lose their consciousness. Uh, older kids will have a characteristic squat, so if you see that in an MCQ, you know what it is. Um, but um, all of this is due to um, increased right to left shunting when, um, uh, when the um, uh, baby or infant is working really hard, which causes decreased pulmonary vascular resistance and decreased systemic resistance. So all of that flow is now going back from the um, right heart to the left heart. And the reason why squatting or in the case of a baby, bringing the knees to the chest works is it increases the afterload to the left ventricle and kind of overcomes this VSD in order to get some blood back into the pulmonary system. Um, because you have a pulmonary stenosis, you get a harsh ejection systolic murmur in the left sternal broader and you also get a loud S2. Um, with the ECG, oh, with the chest x-ray, um, so another buzzword is the boot shaped heart kind of looks like this, kind of looks like a boot. And then again, the echo is diagnostic of this. Um, for the management of these patients, um, we actually like want to put their knees to the chest or get them to squat down if they're having an episode. If it, that doesn't resolve it, you need to give um, the child oxygen, fluid bolus. You can give them morphine and beta blockers to kind of help reduce that uh, resistance. Uh, and these should be repaired at about six months and earlier if it's very severe. Next is the transposition of the great vessel. So as I said before, when the, um, when the truncus arteriosus is um, forming the spiral septum, it kind of separates it out into the pulmonary vein artery and the aorta. However, if this spiral spectrum doesn't form properly, then you get basically two hearts that are separate from each other. So you have a systemic circulation and a pulmonary circulation, which are both separate. Um, and the only way that it's getting mixing, as in this picture, is if there's a shunt. So if there's an ASD, a VSD, or a doctor's arteriosis, this is the only way that oxygen is getting around the body. There is another type called uh, levo transposition of the gray arteries. And it's kind of like two mistakes makes something OK. So in this case, the venous drainage is also flipped. So the vena cava is going to the left, and the pulmonary artery is going to the right. And so Technically, you've got this backwards heart that kind of works, but really doesn't. These patients don't have any cyanosis, but they do develop into heart, uh, but they will develop into heart failure because the right heart isn't designed to cope with the left, um, the loads of the left heart. So uh, some risk factors, so maternal diabetes, rubella, alcohol exposure, and uh, increasing maternal age. And um, these present with severe cyanosis about a day or two after the birth, and that's when the ductus arteriosus is closing. As soon as it closes, um, um, the baby now has two separate systems and um, is life-threatening. Uh, if they have a very big VSD though, the cyanosis might not even happen, but then you get the signs of heart failure later on because they're still mixing. Uh, importantly, on examination, there's no murmur, so if it's, uh, on an exam, MCQ question says no murmur, think TGA. Um, and with the investigations, you can get, on the chest x-ray, you can get this egg on a string. I'm not very convinced, but you can imagine it. And then you can also get an echo, which is diagnostic. Again, with the um, coarctation, you want to keep the ductus arteriosus open. So you put the prostaglandins. Um, you can actually, because of how severe um, it is, you can actually create an ASD using a balloon atrial septostomy, and that gives enough of a shunt in order for there to be mixing of blood. And then the surgical procedure is called an arterial switch procedure. So you flip the two vessels around. I'm going to quickly mention the other ones just because there are options on the MCR, but they tend to not show up very much. So truncus arteriosus associated with the George syndrome, and it's basically the origin. Basically, when we were talking about embryology and we had the truncus arteriosus, um, that doesn't separate the vessels properly. So now you get one big vessel that gives off the aorta, the pulmonary, 
uh, in the pulmonary arteries and you have a um this is flipped the wrong way but like you have a vsd that creates this one big um artery basically with tricuspid atresia your tricuspid valve basically fuses together and thus you can't there's no flow from the right atrium to the right ventricle um so um you get cyanose because there's no flow to the right heart um and similar and then you, um, yeah, and then similarly, you need to use a prostaglandin to keep this shunt open in order for blood to mix in the first place. TAPVR um, is when all your pulmonary veins return to the right side of the heart. So you end up with this situation where all this oxygenated blood is just going straight back into the right atrium and not into the left atrium. Um, you need an ASD in order for the blood to flow through, and this doesn't need sur uh, urgent surgical repair. Uh, there's also two other ones here. They're just more for completion sake, but you don't really need to know them. Cool. And then I'm also going to quickly talk about innocent murmurs because it has shown up in an MCQ before. So innocent murmurs are just murmurs that aren't pathological. Most kids will have them. About, I think, something like 50 to 80% of some people will have them at some point of their life. Um, and the way to tell that they're innocent is that they're soft, they're vibratory, ejection systolic murmurs. There's no extra clicks, there is no symptoms, so they don't have heart failure. It changes with position, so it gets loudest when they're lying down. And it also gets louder when they increase their cardiac output. So when they have a fever or when they're sick, you can hear these moments more clearly. Alrighty, so that's all the congenital heart diseases. So I'm gonna quickly talk about rheumatic fever. So rheumatic fever, um, hopefully you guys know, it's from group A strep and it's an autoimmune response to that group A strep and it causes inflammation of the joint muscles and most importantly for this lecture, causes rheumatic heart disease because it, because it damages the heart. It's kind of rare in Australia nowadays because we're very good with antibiotic treatment, but things you need to be considerate are people of remote indigenous communities or migrants from lower socioeconomic backgrounds because um, they're more at risk. And then in order to get um, this autoimmune response, you have to get the group A strep first. So the most common one is getting tonsillitis or pharyngitis, so strep throat. Uh, you guys should remember Joe's criteria. So in an exam question, they're just going to have like two or three of these things. So Joe's joint involvement, O looks like a heart, so it's all your carditis. Um, N, can, I learned this the other way, so I learned N as like neural, so it's like the chorea. The aerofibrin marginatum is a rash that can occur, and then S is subcutaneous nodules, but you can remember any way you can. And the way you get the criteria is that you need to have either positive throat cultures or elevated anti streptolysin as well as two of these or one of these and two of these. So these are more just biological markers. Uh, a little bit more about the symptoms. So the joint pain is something called migratory polyarthritis. So this Polyarthritis just means a lot of joints are affected, and migratory means it goes to different places. So one joint can be getting worse, one joint can be getting better, but then they can they just have these different joints that are happening at the same at uh, different times. All your carditis can occur, so pericarditis, myocarditis, endocarditis. Um, this creates this is an issue because it creates inflammation and then causes sclerotic scarring, which causes irreversible damage. These patients are at high risk of infective endocarditis. And the buzzword you guys should know for your MCRs is um, they tend to present with mitral stenosis later on in life. You get subcutaneous nodules, so little, they tend to be very small but firm on the extensor surfaces. Chorea, because these um, autoimmune antibodies are depositing into the brain as well, so you can get um, dancing movements. And erythema marginatum are these kind of erythema's macules with central clearing and kind of looks like smoke rings. Management, you manage the same way as you manage strep throat, so you can give them um, penicillin V, so benoxymethyl penicillin, or you can give them benzophene, benzyl penicillin, which you, they only need to get once a month, which is good if you don't think they're going to comply with the um, oral tablets. Aspirin is very good for the joint pain that occurs. And with rheumatic fever, it's important to note that if they have rheumatic fever, they need to be on preventative medications. So either the medications, uh, so it will be the same medications as the treatment, but they'll need to either take it for 10 years or until they're 21, whichever happens first, if it's not severe. 
until they're 35, it's just moderate, and then until 40 or even lifelong if they had severe complications or they have cardiac valve surgery. All right, and then kind of another aside, Kawasaki disease, which is kind of cardiovascular, I guess, because it's vasculitis. So Kawasaki is a vasculitis of the median vessels. Mostly occurs under the age of five, generally when they're about one or two years old. And here's the diagnostic criteria. So they must have fever of 39 plus, so very high fever for more than five days. And either four of these five, so conjunctivitis, a polymorphous rash, erythema and painful edema of the palms and soles, cervical adenopathy, which is generally one-sided and very painful, and also oral and lip mucosa involvement. So the classic strawberry tongue. Uh, denied strawberry tongue is also a buzzword for like scarlet fever. But, yeah. um, if there's any coronary artery, uh, artery abnormalities involved though, it's automatically Kawasaki, even if they don't have all five. So if they've only had two, it will still be Kawasaki disease. For these patients, it's very important that they all get a baseline echo and at six, um, and also get one, another one at six weeks just to make sure there's no changes. The risk of Kawasaki disease is um, coronary on artery aneurysms. And so you need to make sure they don't have those. You can also consider these other tests just to make, just to rule out other causes. Um, but important, if you suspect Kawasaki disease, you need to give them IVIG. You can also give them aspirin, which can start with some of the platelet dysfunction that can occur. But given that these kids are really young, you need to be careful of Ray syndrome. So you need to balance whether or not you think it's relevant or not. Uh, corticosteroids aren't typically used anymore, but if you have really high risk, then you can give them um, corticosteroids as well. Alrighty, uh, I'm just going to do some MCQs to finish up. Um, the MCQs are going to be pretty straightforward, but these are the ones you're going to get in the PEDS exam. So hopefully you guys can all do all of these. So an asyanotic four-month-old infant with poor weight gain, poor feeding, tachypnea, and a loud pansystolic murmur over the whole precordial. Cool. So hopefully everyone's locked in an answer. So the answer is ventricular septal defect. So acyanotic presents within months to weeks to months, so four months, and failure to thrive for feeding and the uh, master chef hands the solid level. <laughs> cool. A two-day-old cyanotic baby, no evidence of respiratory pathology on chest x-ray and no murmurs to be heard. Um, I think it can be if it's a small one. This is from a past paper, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Typically, it's in that spot, but it can be. If it's a small VSD, uh, yeah, it's kind of. When I wrote this question, so you might have to bring it up with them, but. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, typically, I mean, loud is, I guess, is a subjective thing. It's like it can be moderate size, I guess, and still be pretty loud. But, yeah. you did, that is a good point. <laughs> So hopefully everyone's got this one. So this is transposition of the great artery and great vessels or arteries. Uh, key is very young baby, cyanotic, no members. And I said no respiratory problem, so it's not a respite. Asymptomatic child of seven years, ejection is solid with a thick splitting of second heart sound. Thank <laughs> you. 
So hopefully everyone got this one. It's nasty. Uh, rejection systolic splitting is symptomatic. Pretty typical. And the last one, four week old with possible allergial syndrome noted to have an ejection systolic number. So this one is pulmonary stenosis. So syndromic features, ejection systolic murmur. It's I think pulmonary stenosis. Alrighty. So end of presentation. Uh, anyone got any questions?